the Maker and Learning Institute podcast, uh, which is coming from New York this evening. Uh, the Maker and Learning Institute is a professional development initiative coming out of Marymount School of New York and was funded by the Edward E. Ford Foundation. Um, Eric and I had a, an idea a few years back to actually tr try and reimagine professional development uh, in education. And in the last three years, we've had about, seven, about 500 attendees from 100 different schools partake in professional development experience at Marymount School in New York. These were things like half day immersion experiences, innovation coaching. We actually brought parents into it, had parent talks, and often the sessions were run with students. And so this year, um, we're experimenting with a new channel, and that channel is the podcast, uh, to see if that brings up different things in professional development. So welcome everyone, and tonight, I want to welcome our guest, Lisa Yokana, who is at the Scarsdale Public School. Um, and another channel that uh, Eric has been working on is that he's created a platform for educators to actually publish. Um, this was sort of started with that, often how educators share their experiences at conferences. The second thing we thought they could do was, well, let's get them published. And Based on the authors that were published on this, we started the third channel, which is the podcast. And so Lisa is published in the second edition of the From Prototype to Pitch, New Pathways in Design, Maker, and Entrepreneurship Education. And so, actually in the first one, too. And Lisa's in the first one. But welcome, Lisa. We're so glad you've joined us tonight. Well, I'm glad to be here. Awesome. So do you want me to just take over now and uh, talk a little bit? Okay, good. Yes. So what, in, in the usual format, Lisa is going to start with a presentation to give you a glimpse of what she does in, in Scarsdale, and then we'll go straight into the conversation about Lisa's work. Great. So I'm going to try to share my screen here. And you guys tell me, can you see that? Eric and Don? Yeah, it's, you got it. Okay, great. So um, this journey began uh, back in 2012. Um, we have a parent foundation at Scarsdale and they decided to give money to all five elementary schools to create a makerspace in each of the elementary schools. And at that point, uh, we sort of looked around and said, wow, okay, if this is going to happen at the elementary schools, then it's going to start, you know, it's going to trickle up eventually to the high school. Um, I uh, started life as, well, as an art teacher, oops. Um, and I noticed how, and I was teaching art and architecture at Scarsdale, and I noticed in my classroom how engaged students were, how excited they were, and also how students who were not traditionally, quote unquote, good students really shone um, and uh, were able to be successful. Lisa, um, I don't mean to interrupt, but we yeah. can't see your slides. So can't see my slide. You want to just double check that you've shared your screen? Okay. There we Should go. Okay. Okay. There Great. we go. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, that's all right. Okay. So <laughs> there's my there's my so we're st STEAM, not STEM, um, and that's very purposeful. The A is the arts, um, the design piece, and um, also, I like to think of it as agency, and we can, we'll talk a little bit more about that. So um, we began by asking, what skills and mindsets do our students need for the future? Um, we did a really deep dive into that. Um, and we also began by talking to our students who were in college already doing uh, engineering and comp sci. Um, our board of ed, said to us, you know, teach engineering. We want to have engineering. We want our students to go into STEM fields. Um, and I really felt strongly that that was not enough. So we went out to our alums who were in college already doing this work and we said, how could we have better prepared you? Um, and these were the answers they gave us. They said they didn't really know about the different engineering fields. So when they, when they decided to do engineering in, in uh, college, they were kind of going on just sort of a hunch um, and they didn't really know all the different fields that existed. They also said, 
They wanted to uh, really know what sort of tools and software were out there. They felt they were really behind their classmates um, in engineering school um, because they had never really seen any of this stuff. They had never 3D modeled um, any of it. Um, and then they also, this whole idea of having a um, hands-on making experiences, they didn't know how to take an idea that existed in their head and make it real and physical. So that whole process of taking an idea and then actually physically making it was something that they had never really experienced except in art classes. Um, and then this whole idea of bias towards action, the idea that an innovator is someone who goes out into the world and sees opportunities and then has the creative confidence to act on them. So that's what we heard from our um, alums and that was really exciting. Um, I, at that point, was working with Agency by Design, which is a research project that's part of Project Zero, which is a decades-old um, research project uh, out of Harvard Graduate School of Education, which really focuses on the learning um, behind the arts and through the arts. And Agency by Design is looking specifically at the learning, the thinking and learning in maker-centered classrooms. And they've really identi they had identified three capacities um, that led to this maker mindset, um, to the sense of agency. Uh, the first is looking closely, so really deeply noticing details, um, and then understanding sort of how those things, uh, all the different parts of something work together, so investigating the interactions between the different parts, and that can be in objects or in systems. And then once a student looks closely at the world around them, understands that um, there are there's this de design dimension of the world that then allows them to find opportunity um, and look for opportunities around them to design or tinker or hack and so I really thought those three um, things were incredibly important and that's um, pretty much what we based our whole program on as we started to develop it um, our whole program is based on learning by doing. We do not stand at the front of the room and lecture. Um, and you'll see these are pictures of my classroom as it exists at this very moment. Um, we, um, and I'll talk a little bit more about that. We started the program without a physical space. So unlike most schools, we didn't build the shiny new maker space and then create programming for it we did the opposite, um, in part because we're a public school and our Board of Ed wanted to know that there was going to, there were gonna be students who wanted to take these classes. So we started, um, we started the program a year and a half ago, and this is the physics classroom that we have borrowed from our science department for the last, three, uh, last year and a half, um, which has been incredible that they've allowed us to do that. And, um, it's uh, it's a science classroom, so it's it's incredibly annoying. But we are about to move out of that, and uh, well, I'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, so the way we developed our program, we looked at a bunch of existing programs. Uh, I traveled all over looking at maker spaces and talking to schools uh, that were doing this type of work, um, and we felt that we didn't want a canned program. Um, so we looked at Project Lead the Way, but we felt like it was just too, um, uh, too prescribed for us. Um, I've been doing a lot of work in design and design thinking, and I really thought that the mindsets um, and the skills that that taught were imperative for students to learn. So we designed a three-level sequence, um, and this is how it sort of plays out. Our first level are two electives, um, Introduction to Design and Fabrication and Intro to Engineering. Uh, they are taught two days a week for one semester. So it's literally a quarter credit. Um, this is entirely an elective program too. It doesn't fit in um, any other department. It's not a, a science credit or an art credit. Um, it is purely an elective credit. So one of the reasons we decided to create the intro courses at, with two days a week was that it would fit into pretty much any student's schedule. And we really wanted to have um, this program open to, to just about anyone. Um, our freshmen are not allowed to take it yet because uh, I think everyone felt they were just too overscheduled. So as sophomores, they can take this, even if they have to take the required health course, um, it still will fit into their schedule. 
So they start um, in design and fabrication, and I'll talk about them each a little bit more, and intro to engineering, and they can take either one of those and then go on to take a second level electives, elective, which we um, now have four of, um, which meet four days a week, which is what our classes meet um, for one semester. And then finally, um, we next year we will have uh, AT entrepreneurship, and that's something that we prototyped this year um, with uh, an independent study. So I have eight students that I've been working with all year, uh, meeting only one one day a week, which is very frustrating. But um, next year we will have a regular four day a week AT entrepreneurship, and it's AT, which means advanced topics. Um, Scarsdale did away with. Um, advanced placement probably 13, 12 or 13 years ago um, in favor of teaching uh, sort of richer, deeper and not running through content. So um, we don't have APs, but we have an AT, which is an advanced topic, which is a college level course. Um, so in intro to engineering, they do some very basic things like they do a product take apart, they do a little bit of robotics, they get a taste of it and they learn um, a little teeny bit of coding and circuitry um, playing with the Arduinos. Um, then in design and fabrication, they learn the design process. They take a stab at solving a real problem. So they, um, in the left bottom left corner, you'll see a fidget toy that someone made um, as they were solving for stress. Um, they do a little intro to 3D modeling and printing and they also learn uh, some woodworking. And all of these skills they learn while they're solving real problems. One of the students in the bottom right corner actually made this great hot glue gun holder because they were solving for storage solutions in our room. Then our second level courses, uh, Design for Modern Production is a deeper dive into 3D modeling and 3D printing. They, we use Fusion 360 because it's uh, cloud-based and it's also free, which is nice. So students can work on it at home. Um, they do a real design, pro um, design problem as well. And they take that problem all the way to a full scale prototype, um, usually using the 3D modeling to prototype along the way. Design build, um, again, taking the design process, um, actually learning to take uh, an idea that exists in your head, <clears throat> excuse me, head and make it real and physical. Um, and they do full scale builds, they learn woodworking um, and some uh, bit of manufacturing. So here there's two pictures on the left is a prototype that was made out of triple ply cardboard. Uh, last semester they had to create seating for a new outdoor space in our school that would um, encourage students to actually use that space. So on the left um, is a, a triple ply cardboard. Prototype. They all um, worked in teams and made full scale prototypes out of triple ply cardboard, which supports weight. We did a chair fair when we invited all students to come and sit in the chairs and give feedback and actually vote. And then we created the um, favorite two, you can see the the chair on the right, um, the favorite two were created out of wood. <clears throat> so the students cre um, learned how to build and do joinery. Um, robotics, um, again, learning the design process, but here really learning sort of the nuts and bolts of how to do robotics. So it's the structure and building mechanisms in order to make something move and also the programming piece of it. And then tackling a real um, problem once you've, uh, once you've learned the basic skills. And then physical computing and wearables. Um, this is the course that I teach. It's advanced electronics, circuitry, some programming. Um, and in the bottom right here is a, a sock that one of my students created. She's a runner and that was her sole project. So as she ran, her sock lit up and um, it, was, uh, it was great for running at night. Um, then, oops, what have I done? Oh, there we go. And then our third year capstone course, Entrepreneurship, which will be four days a week next year, a full, full, for a full year, not just a semester. And then working through the complete design process from finding the need all the way, well, not to mass production probably, but through um, a, a pretty high res prototype, um, learning uh, the business canvas model, um, 
And so really taking that design process like all the way through to developing some sort of product that exists at the uh, center of techno of feasibility, viability, and desirability. Um, and this year we prototyped entrepreneurship. Um, <clears throat> we've started with a problem. They're looking at cell phone use in the in the high school, um, and you can see a little video of them on the left, and they're actually mind mapping. The, uh, the cell phone problem, you can see the mind map on the right. This was kind of what they did originally to start to break the problem apart and then to know where to dive in and start doing some research. They've been through a number of prototypes already, um, prototype and test. And um, it's been really interesting for me to work with them and really just sort of follow the arc of the process uh, with both the highs and the lows that they, that they experience. Um, so I think what we've seen is that these mindsets are so important. Radical collaboration. Um, I think that just goes across all experiences, whether it's in school, outside of school. Um, it's you know something that's important for them as they as they go through life. Uh, the idea of showing show don't tell. So actually making something and then getting feedback on it. Being very mindful of the process itself, um, learning to prototype, uh, and then we're always doing human-centered design, I think is hugely important. And then this whole idea of student agency, this bias towards action, which I think is um, probably the most important thing there. I feel like a lot of our education um, takes power away from our students. Um, because they're literally just sitting and getting information and then spitting it back. So um, the idea that they can actually do something and you know, hopefully we've created this program that scaffolds these experiences for them so that they gradually go through and gain more creative confidence. They, they gain a, a greater ability to look at the world around them um, and notice where there might be opportunities uh, to make a change and then it also gives them the tools and the process to go through that whole problem solving. And then uh, the creative confidence to really stick with it and hopefully make a change in their world. And that's, I think, something that's so important that, that sort of speaks beyond all the STEM, STEAM stuff is that we want to create citizens of the world. Like, this is my job as a teacher, right? I want to go out and I want to create students who are empathic who know that they can um, affect the world around them for better and make it a better place, um, and that are really mindful of their role in it and their sort of their place in the world. And and, and if we can do that, then I think uh, and I think we're we've been incredibly successful. And we're seeing it. We're seeing it work. Um, we see the students who take our courses, uh, you know, they're, they're just much more um, active. They, they jump in and they get excited about stuff. They don't sit back and wait for the world to come to them. So uh, year and a half in, um, we're doing pretty well. And I think that is my last slide. So I'm gonna try to figure out how to unshare this. Yep, I did it, look at that. And uh, yeah, so that's kind of, that's our program. Um, we did, we have started in this uh, hacked physics space, which has been great. Um, and we are about to move into our 4,000 square foot design lab, which is really exciting, um, a week from Monday. So we have actually done, we have built the space after we designed the program, which is kind of the opposite of, of what a lot of schools do. And I think that's hugely important rather than sort of creating this space and then wondering what in the world is going to happen to in it. We have um, created the need and the program. And now, um, now we actually have the space that we're going to move into. Um, and as we designed it, we really thought about it being a flexible shell so that as um, technologies change and as our needs change, we can literally unplug things, roll them out the garage door, and roll new things in. Um, yeah, so we're gonna have flexible furniture, 
and um, at one end there's actually a woodworking space behind glazing, the other end digital fabrication behind glazing, and then a really large center space for electronics, robotics, and uh, more sort of gen uh, general design work. So yeah, that's where we are. Right, awesome. Thanks, Lisa, for, uh, for sharing that. Um, uh, awesome stuff. So here's the, f the first thing I'm thinking. So, you know, you said program first, space later. You know, and I think that's really what's fascinating about this because um, the first thing a school does when it wants to introduce a new program is it's all about the space. Where will that happen, mm -hmm. right? Um, and, you know, it, it tends to be the big constraint because there's the whole thing of like, where are we going to build the space? What gets lost? Where do we put it, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but you went straight with the program, right? But, so, but did you have to negotiate this physics lab? Like, how did you convince them? Because you still needed a space. You just didn't have an engineering space. You just needed a space, right? Yeah, it, it, it was a bit of a debate. And um, I think our science department is huge. And it's not that they could give up the classroom. They definitely couldn't. Um, but our, I think our most advanced physics le level doesn't have a lot of labs. So it seemed like they could ease, not easily, but they could move to another classroom, sort of a regular classroom. We talked about um, <clears throat> maybe borrowing an art room, but that, that just didn't seem to be the right fit. Um, and, and using a regular classroom wouldn't have, wouldn't have worked either, even if we'd put different furniture in it, because we really felt we, we needed a sink. Um, so a science room was kind of the, the way to go and and it's fairly large so that also allowed us we did one of the things about it is that the tables are actually fixed to the floor which makes me crazy um, and we did uh last over the summer we asked them to take out a table which gives us a little bit more space but um it definitely is a room that is teacher centered uh you know there's a smart board at the front and a chalkboard and a teacher desk and then all the little tables lined up focusing on the front table so it's been challenging i think to run design classes in there and and sort of break that physical mode too because we know that you know physical space does really affect the way um you act in a space so um that's been really challenging and uh but i think it's worked and i think um I think it's going to be very exciting as we move into this new space to see how that sort of even invigorates these classes and invigorates our kids more. Um, <clears throat> part of what we did in designing the space was make sure that it looked like no other space in the school. Um, there's a lot of glass, uh, so you, it's, it's transparent from the corridor to, um, to the interior. There's big windows everywhere. As you walk by the two corridors um, that are adjacent to it, you have full view of what's going on. Um, the woodworking shop and the digital fabrication are behind glass walls. So we really wanted it to be transparent, both, um, you know, literally and physically. And, um, and, and we have a bright orange wall and flexible furniture. So I think it really, the space will actually announce that it's a different different kind of learning is going on in here. So um, it, I think it might actually make our jobs easier now, rather than uh, rather than more difficult. So yeah. So uh, like you know, not to get hung up on the space thing, but I think that's uh, often what interests a lot of educators because it is about the, the you know the space. Right. Um, and, and I always describe a maker space as a collision between uh, a science lab and an art studio. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, because that's really what it is, because you mentioned, well, we needed a sink, right. you know, so, so there, there are those basic needs that you need <laughs> if you want to set up some sort of engineering, design, build, whatever program, that there's, the sink thing is important. So I guess leaning on the scientists and trying and giving them up, them giving up their space, you know, is a great, great idea. And that may be as something for our audience to, to think about, like if you're thinking about building out a program, can you go out tomorrow and look around your school mm -hmm. for a substitute space? You know, where, where is that, where that might be? I mean, the science and the art room are obvious places now, but where else could that be? 
Yeah, um, and I think I think you can hack most spaces. I mean, even if you don't have a sink, you can bring in water in a bucket. I mean, I think the idea of hacking a space and um, you know putting a whole bunch of tools on a cart and taking them somewhere. I think, I mean, right now I'm teaching physical computing in a computer lab, which is awful, but um, there are big tables and we kind of push the computers aside um, and we're soldering in there and I've got a big electronics cart. So I think you can, it's, it's more about sort of like, how are you gonna do this? Where are you gonna do it? That's a challenge for sure, but I think, um, I think the idea of just taking a classroom or even taking a common space, I've seen maker spaces in hallways, um, gyms, libraries. So, you know, I think you can look around and find a fairly unused space. And, and the other thing was we, we were in the position that we had an old auto lab that hadn't been used. Uh, I've been at Scarsdale for 10 years, had never been used when I was there, been um, probably 12 to 15 years since that space had been used. And so that became the perfect place to put it because here was this underutilized, this non-used space. Um, and even in a, in a school where we don't have enough space for every kid quite often, um, we were able to find some nooks and crannies. Um, and there were times when I, when I was doing these projects um, in the past, where we literally, we would just take over half of a gym for a little while and, um, you know, bring stuff in in a cart and, and just figure it out. So I think space is definitely an issue, but I think if you want to start something, you just, you know, kind of find a space that's not used for a few hours and, and, and make it happen there. Yeah, yeah, Lisa. And I think particularly, uh, I often try and steer people in the direction of a low res yes. space. You know, it's for low res prototyping and that you can sort of jumpstart really quickly. But I do also warn them that this can turn into an arts and crafts center. I, I feel we got to be really careful with low res prototypes because um, I find that in a lot of the work I do with design thinking um, is that, that the first step of the prototype is a low res prototype. But if that's not really, if you don't help them understand that what this prototype is. It's about get, getting your idea across so it makes sense to get feedback. People poo-poo it as a, you know, arts and crafts. So I'm making yeah. this, I'm making that. Um, but, you know, grounding it in that initially, I think is a really good idea. But, you know, for some reason, the focus with a lot of, like if someone doesn't see a 3D printer in a makerspace, that like that's what they expect to see. So it's managing those expectations. And of course you need the, the CNC machines and the laser cutter and the vinyl cutter, um, you know, but I'm wondering, you know, how can we help people, you know, with this accepting more of a low risk space and bringing in um, the other things? Because your space that you're working in, Lisa, it does have a laser cutter, right, that I've seen? And no, actually, we, we have a laser cutter in school, but it lives in the uh, sculpture studio. So okay. we can use it, but in our new space, we have, we'll have one. But, um, so I had used the laser cutter when I was teaching architecture and knew what an incredible tool it was. Mm -hmm. So I knew that we needed one in our new space, but we've kind of done without it in the classroom for the last year and a half. Um, we'll take files and go down and, and cut them and bring them back. But um, with our new space, the kids will be able to, you know, just do it themselves, which is great. Um, no, I was gonna say like, you were, no. saying, you were saying the whole idea of like the, starting with the low res, which I, I think is so important. Um, but then there's this, and I think it's probably easier at the elementary level and maybe the middle school level, but there is a certain line at the high school where if they've been doing the low res uh, prototypes for a while, they need at some point to make something that they're proud of. Mm -hmm. And um, it can be something that they've 3D printed on a, on a small scale or something that they laser cut that's very small or just something that they've put together with a, with a high degree of craftsmanship. Um, they, they love using tools. And I think one of the greatest things for me is to watch young women with power tools. It's incredible. They are so excited. They're always excited. And, and it doesn't mean that you need to have like a whole bunch of machinery. You can have a drill that comes with you into a space or a handsaw, anything. Um, 
they love to use tools and and it's really empowering particularly for young women when they uh when they start to do that and and learn um that they can use them safely and they can make things happen so for the audience lisa um and, and this sort of uh, hack space that you have, what equipment is in there that people would recognize as a maker space? <laughs> yeah, so we have a lot of hand tools um, because we do, um, we've been, because we don't have dust collection in our hacked space, we really haven't done woodworking too much. We've had to kind of cut things off site and then assemble when we do, when we made the chairs, for instance. Um, but we use triple ply cardboard. It is my best friend. Um, you can buy it uh, from Staples. Um, it's not incredibly cheap, but it's not terribly expensive either. It's structurally incredibly sound. So we do a lot of prototyping with triple ply cardboard because you can make a chair that you can sit on um, and other things like that. We have, so we have a lot of hand tools. Um, we do have uh, 3D printers in there. Um, and we do have, uh, we have a bandsaw, um, which the kids use with the triple ply cardboard. Um, so they're learning the tools of woodworking. Um, what else do we have? Oh, we have robotics. So we have, um, we use VEX robotics. We have Arduinos um, and um, a lot of different uh, microcontrollers and sensors and things like that. So they're learning all of that. I do teach a, a small unit on um, sewable electronics. So. We have some sewing machines and um, we have a lot of craft materials. We have a ton of prototyping stuff um, and things like scissors and rulers and X-Acto knives and um, you know all things that are pretty easy to come by and don't require a, a shiny space you know, that you can yeah. literally put on a cart and drag around with you. Yeah, and I think that's something for the audience to um, take heed of as well. He said that if you wanted to move from low res into electronics, electronics are very easy. Again, it doesn't take the, you know, you don't need all of the uh, vacuum to get rid of the dust from laser cutters and all of that, you know. Right. And I think maybe thinking about a program like that and how you can notch it up, because you can bring in the Arduinos um, very simply, you know, it's like a, a next step up till maybe you eventually graduate to the really big, uh, sort of, you know, bigger equipment, you know, the CNC or the laser cutters. Yeah, and I think if you don't want to dive right in with the Arduinos, because they can be a little intimidating. I mean, there's things like Makey Makeys. There's a lot of uh, microcontrollers now that are coming with code already on them um, that you can, uh, you know, like there's the Lily Twinkle. And so they're different, different, um, and the Makey Makey is so simple. So there's ways that younger kids or even um, high school kids can sort of get a taste of something. Um, and that's, that's also something that I did before we even had the program. I did a lot of just hacking um, classes or um, I, I was doing a lot of interdisciplinary work. So I w part of what that became was helping teachers. I would help facilitate a maker experience in their classroom. And I think I wrote about this in the first, uh, the first volume um, that, uh, I mean, like I have social studies teachers who do who wanted to do things like um, have their students create a memorial to you know memorialize World War One. So how how did you actually? We had to actually turn a regular social studies classroom into a mini maker space for five days. Um, and so I would go in and bring my exacto knives and my rulers and my hot glue guns, and we would sort of set up the room. And then I would do a little demo with the kids. This is how you use an X-Acto. Um, you know, this is where the glue guns will be used. All of that, we talked a little bit about safety. And then I would sort of be there to help the teachers facilitate those maker experiences. So it would be, you know, a social studies teacher who wasn't comfortable making things, but really thought that it would be cool for her or his students to make something that demonstrated their knowledge. Um, and so I was there to sort of write the curriculum with them, support them while they were doing it, and um, actually make sure that nobody cut themselves with the, with the X-Acto knives. Um, and so we did a lot of hacking spaces at that point. We, um, and I think those kinds of experiences set the tone for our program. Um, it got students excited about it. They talked about, you know, and we were really good at capturing that learning. 
we would bring a videographer, you know, we, you know, a guy with a video camera in and, or me with my cell phone saying, can you tell me about how making that World War One memorial, how did that show what you learned? You know, and, and kids are actually really good at talking about how a physical object demonstrates their understanding. So I think we did a lot of that um, in the sort of six years before we created the program, the five or six years, so that we were sort of building that culture in our school. Um, and so the hope is with the lab that we'll have other classes and other teachers uh, coming into that lab doing maker experiences with their students. Right, right, right. So as a, a recap for our audience then, because um, you know I love that line you have, which is program first, like space sort of later. Yeah. Um, that really, if you're thinking about these spaces that maybe, you know, breaking it up into low res, then moving to electronics, and this only will build your case if you have to prove the needs of such a space. Yeah. Um, because you do need to defend these spaces. It's not like a science lab that like, it's just an assumption, oh, that's, we need science labs, you know what I mean? But we're still at the stage with this that you have to prove the case, right? Yeah, and I think that that, that was part of what I did. <laughs> it's part of what I did for the last five years is make the case for making. Because um, we are a public school and, you know, we do have standards and we do have requirements and they have to pass tests at the end of the year, all of that. <laughs> so, you know, it's not quite as open perhaps as an, a private school. And I have worked in private schools before this. So, you know, part of what I had to do was make the case for making. And um, I did that by, I, I went out and looked at what universities were doing as well um, and talked to uh, professors at universities and colleges and said, you know, what, what kinds of things, what kinds of skills, what kinds of mindsets should students have when they come to you? And, and so all of that sort of helped build um, the case for making. And then, as you said, too, like really doing it with a few select teachers who were really excited about doing it in their own classrooms and then um, just capturing that learning and, um, and sort of celebrating it, I think, is really important, too. Right, right. So, yeah, so it, it seems like, Lisa, you know, we've been talking about the build, design, make electronics, and that's, you know, got a lot of traction in schools at this point. There's a lot of schools doing this stuff. But you decided in, in designing this program that, you know, your, your pinnacle at the top, the last thing is entrepreneurship. Mm -hmm. What made you, like, how did that come about? Did that seem natural or what? Talk to us about it. Yeah, I think um, I was talking to a lot of colleges that were that are doing entrepreneurship. Um, there's a lot of uh, universities doing it, um, and I think also for our community that seemed like the pinnacle. We have um, we have a very uh, savvy parent body. Um, a lot of them are entrepreneurs. Uh, a lot of them are quite su successful, and they were really excited. The, the parent body was really excited about our kids being entrepreneurs. Um, but for me, I think, and, and we've talked about this, Don, I think the thing is that um, entrepreneurship is not about uh, bringing a product to market. We've been very, very careful about stating that our entrepreneurship class is about teaching entrepreneurial skills and mindsets. Um, because we want our students to go out into the world and look for opportunities and design solutions. I mean. I always say to my students, my generation has pretty much screwed up the world. It's up to yours to figure it out. So you'd better figure it out and you better have a process to do it. Um, to me, the entrepreneurship um, process, uh, working with one problem for a full year, uh, incredibly frustrating as that can be for kids, I think it teaches them so much about sticking with something and you know, reframing and going back to the drawing board. And those are things they don't learn in traditional classrooms. Um, but those are the skills that, and that they'll need when they go out into the world. So it just makes sense that we should be teaching them. And, and it's certainly happening at the college level. I think uh, there's so many um, universities and colleges that are doing entrepreneurship. So it just seemed like, a, like it made sense, I guess. Yeah, it is. I think it's a big part of our world about, you know, we are at that stage as, you know, as like Wagner says, you know, um, inventing jobs, mm -hmm. you know, that's a big part. So they're 
there will be a lot more entrepreneurs and a lot more, you know, people in the gig economy. I think this is a big driver of it. Yeah. But, um, you know, Eric here being the director of uh, STEAM at Marymount, um, uh, and I've been working with him on uh, this entrepreneurship elective, which I believe now is in year three, right, Eric? Um, no, I think year. four. I think this is oh, year four? number four. Wow. Okay. And, you know, my one big takeaway um, with entrepreneurship is that um, the deliverable, you have to be comfortable that the deliverable changes every single time you do it. It, it does not end up in the requirement like a history class, which might be essays, or like in a math class, which is math problems, or science experiments in a science class. The deliverable has to shift and change. And it's really trying to um, get administration comfortable with that, that the kids are having different experiences. So I know in the four iterations, or now it's the fifth, Eric, because we're doing it a second semester mm -hmm. this year all completely different experiences. And I go back and forth with that, thinking, oh my God, is that good or bad? But I think if you try and make it the same, um, it's not real, you know? And yeah, then, it, then it starts to be just sort of something that, it's an exercise, right, or a simulation. And there's, I think our kids are so sick of doing that. Yeah, it, it is. And so what I've been um, advising people is, you know, Think about the methods of design that you can teach them. They can be consistent, you know, the need finding, the affinity mapping, the journey mapping, uh, mind map, whatever that is, um, and have those set of methods. But like it can end up in a totally different place. Yeah. Um, but Lisa, um, before we close up, because I'd spent some time up in Scarsdale today, I think it'd be great for you to tell the audience um, your where your kids are and how st stuck they, they have, have become in, in the problem that they were trying to solve, which is probably the most difficult problem that they could have picked for the audience out there. It's like, if you choose this problem to solve, beware. But Lisa, tell them where they are and what they're solving for. Yeah, so they started with the problem of cell phone use at school. Um, and it was actually me that, that picked that problem, you know, live and learn. But, uh, I wanted them to to have um, access. It, it needed to be something that was, you know, local and that they could just kind of walk out of the classroom and and interview people about. So um, we started with cell phone use. They have been. They I think they're on prototype number five maybe at this point. They've completely changed their ideas. And today when Don came, <laughs> it's pretty funny because. I think in the morning I saw one of the, I have two groups of four students each. I saw one of the kids from one of the groups and he said, oh, last night we, we completely changed our idea, completely changed it. So we haven't tested it, but it's completely different. And I was like, all right, great, good to know, okay. And then the other group went out and tested today and got feedback and just sort of realized like, their idea wasn't that great. And, uh, and they were so dejected. So Don and I were talking to them, uh, during lunch, they missed their lunch, but um, they were, it was like, it was like an energy suck out of the room. I mean, they were just so down. And I think that's one of the things like as a teacher, that's really hard. It's hard to manage that process. It's hard to manage different groups at different stages of the process. But, you know, and then having Don there was so great because it was kind of like, ooh, here's this new person who's gonna tell us something. And it's kind of like, they, they don't listen to me anymore. They've seen me like the entire year. So it's like, ah, oh, it's just Ms. Yokana talking. But, um, you know, then you have someone like Don come in and talk about, you know, something that you've done and success with your students. And, and, it, and it just sort of like, opens them up again and gets them excited again and the energy in, in that room from where they started today to where they ended was enormous I mean that shift was huge and in the middle of looking at the business model canvas one of them was like oh, oh wait I have a new idea oh my gosh and so they really I mean like totally shifted again which is yeah. awesome and great and I think um, you know we have a hard stop at a certain point kind of at the end of the semester and uh, they're going to be where they are yeah. And that's, they're going to present their journey. So, yeah. yeah. So my one big learning from your students today is so they, they showed me their prototype, right? And the prototype was like this house that like, you know, had an upstairs and a downstairs and you push this button, the door would open, you would put in your phone, 
the door would close and then below the other door would open and in it were like, you know, things that you could play with and uh, questions that would start conversation because the idea is that you would put away your phone and you would start conversations and sort of hum be human again. Um, and apparently what, what the students said, they said, oh, well, all they were doing is giving us feedback on how bad our prototype was, <laughs> right? That's what they said, Lisa. It was so yeah. funny because when, when you press down on the button, you know, they didn't have the mechanism so that the door opened. So the student had to open the door and then the student had to put in the thing and they'd open the other door. And so the audience got lost in the bad prototype. It was really interesting, um, which sort of like, you know, points to the fact, well, you know, you want the prototype in some form, right? And I felt that that was like a great I learned from, I never really thought about that before, how this, the feedback all was about like the mechanics of the prototype, but not on the problem they were trying to solve. Yeah. yeah, and I think some of that too is that they're at a stage now where they want to make, like they feel the pressure of the end and they, they feel the pressure to like have a product. Um, right. And they're frustrated because they want it to magically appear and uh, they don't want to go back to the drawing board. Um, yeah. They don't want to go back to their problem statement. I mean, we tried to get them to even say what their problem statement was at this point, and they're like, "Yeah, I don't, I, I don't remember. I, I don't know." Yeah. You know, so it's, it, you know, they they get to this point where they just almost want to be done, and uh, and that's I think hard, right? That's the hard part for us as facilitators of those experiences. How do you how do you keep them going, and how do you, you know, continue to push them through? And it, it, certainly, I'm still learning as I go. That's for sure. Um, yeah. But having yeah. a community of people like Don and, and other people who are doing design, I think is so important um, just for us as facilitators of these experiences so that we don't get depressed. Um, but yeah. also because, you know, I have some tools in my tool bucket, but I don't have all of them. And then I can bring Don in and he's got a whole new set. And, uh, you know, it may be similar to something that I've said before, but he's a new human in the room. And so they're going to pay attention and be polite. So I think, I think that's... Uh, you know, mm. having these different kinds of experiences is important for them as, as you sort of try to keep driving them through it. Yeah, no, that's, that's great advice. So these would be like top tips for those of you starting out entrepreneurship courses. When the students write their problem statements, they need to be pinned up. They need to look at those every time they come in and they should be tweaking them mm -hmm. because the problem actually starts to change. They start to redefine and reframe. So that's really important that those problems, and that's why today I said, that, where's those, those problem statements? Yeah. You know? yeah. And you bring them right back to that problem statement. And the second thing is that it's impossible to teach an entrepreneurship class without a network. I lean on hundreds of people as Eric knows, the troops we've had in um, from all walks, um, because that point of view um, and, you know, the kids, it's someone different for the kids to interact with. And, you know, usually they tell their stories. And by that network, I mean other educators are, you know, um, at the Marymount School, we bring in, you know, as startup entrepreneurs. The kids mm -hmm. are in front every couple of weeks of someone, you know, who's got a startup or who has four startups or this is their, you know, 10th company or, or whatever. Um, but having that problem statement for them to go back to and bring in your network to lean on is really key to the, I think, some entrepreneurship program in your school. Yeah. Um, and I think, I think one of the best things that we've done is to prototype things to mm -hmm. say, like, this is, this class is just a prototype and to really, I, we are so lucky because my principal is so supportive of this and you know which is great so we don't have to worry like that he's going to walk into the room and be like what the heck is going on um so i think that's super important to have that supportive admin piece too um yeah yeah that yeah. allows you to keep playing and tinkering with the with the the classes themselves and i think you have to keep doing it yeah yeah for sure um so lisa before we open up for questions and close out um i want to uh give you my last question, which is from uh, the person, Gail Allen, who she runs the awesome podcast called Curious Minds. And she, her last question is always, which I think is awesome, is there anything I didn't ask you that I should have? Wow, I should have seen that one coming. Isn't that like I so great I when she moved it coming. right back <laughs> to the audience? It's just fantastic. Well, I think um, we didn't really talk about why I think this is so important. Um, I right. have, you know, I've been an educator for a while 
And uh, I feel like education is really beating, beating the crap out of kids. Um, that it's, you know, someone once said to me, wow, if you're an art teacher, somehow your creativity survived school. And I think that's really sad, right? And I've seen, you know, I'm a parent, I've got two daughters in their 20s, and I really saw, you know, for one of them, how hard education was, that it really, she doesn't fit the mold. And, you know, she got kind of beaten up by, by school. And, 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 and I've seen that with kids in my classroom over and over again, particularly when I was teaching architecture, boys who were brilliant spatially, but not traditionally good students, you know, and how when they were finally successful at something, it changed their whole world. And I think that's what's so important. There are so many different kinds of intelligences and there are kids now who are gonna have to go out and, and really think when they go out into the world, you know? And, and I think our traditional education, as we know, like doesn't really prepare them for that. So that's the why. And I think the why is so important. Um, yeah. yeah, absolutely. No, uh, totally makes sense, um, Lisa, because I think education is obsessed with being correct. Mm -hmm. And if you're correct, you're not necessarily going to be creative. And so it's that tension and everything in schools is about right, correct. That's what the edu how the education system is designed. It's not designed to be creative. And I feel that's where we struggle with, with these things. Um, we need to lose some of the correctness and focus on the creativity and see what that bring, brings out. One of the best things, which I forgot to say when I was on that slide, when, when we reached out to our alum, um, I, I had a student who was doing comp sci, actually she and her twin were doing comp sci at a very prestigious university. And in their first semester, they went to a hackathon. And she said to me, my sister and I sat there wondering like what the answer was and we had no idea what was going on and it wasn't until about three quarters of the way through that we realized there wasn't one answer and that's not what this was about and and i just think that's so powerful you know to train kids to look for the right answer that's just not the world the way the world works now mm, exactly awesome so uh lisa thank you for spending all this time with us tonight um really appreciate it um but my pleasure. Awesome. And let's open up the questions, Eric, if there is any. So if we have any questions, you can type them in the chat box if you want. No questions up till now. We had <laughs> no. people are just riveted, Eric, I guess, right? <laughs> it was a compelling presentation. I'll give you that. Well, Eric, thank it really you. was. I learned a lot. Yeah. Eric usually makes up questions. Eric was. <laughs> <laughs> He's done that um, a few times to humor me. <laughs> yeah, I don't think I want to do that tonight. I won't give you a hard time about it. But, um, no, I just, um, you know, I go back to one of the things that you said as well, which was the program comes first and then the space. And I think if we were going to be honest about the work that we've done at Marymount, uh, when we put in our fab lab now, six years ago, it was the space first and then the program. And... Um, I always tell the story when we opened up the space, we heard crickets because people didn't know what the space was. And I don't think we could adequately explain what it was. But when we opened our space at Fifth Avenue, it was the program was sort of there already. So it was easy to build a space around the program that we had. And it was, they were sort of the program grew, the space grew, the program grew in response to that. So they're always sort of these sort of oscillating and competing mm. interests. Um, so I think we learned a lot the second time around than we thought we knew the first time around. Um, and it was a really good lesson for us to learn as well. I can't tell you how many schools call me. <laughs> I just had a call last week. So we have this space and I've been charged with like figuring out we've had it for a year now we don't know what to do in it we have a robotics team but you know that's after school i can't tell you how many people like reach out to me and say like well, what do we do um so yeah you really have to build the culture and i think one of the things we saw at the elementary schools when um the maker spaces were sort of plunked down there you know they um and different teachers sort of took them on at different schools 
Um, it's that onboarding process, right? How do you get a teacher who's not comfortable with this stuff and doesn't have a whole lot of creative confidence? How do you get them to walk through that door and have an experience much less bring their students, right? So teachers are so used to being experts. How can you create onboarding experiences that are um, going to build uh, teachers' creative confidence? And, and I'm really interested in that, obviously, uh, the professional development piece of it. But I think that's, you know, that's so important. You've got you've to build the culture as you build the space or the culture of the program first and then the space. Yeah, yeah, it's very, very complex, you know, it really is like that culture space balance, yeah. right? Yeah. You, you, you kind know. of want it to be symbiotic, right? You want mm -hmm. them to sort of grow together. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm just thinking, wouldn't that be an awesome sight, like to see a space actually grow mm -hmm. physically mm -hmm. while the program started to grow with it? What would that look like, you know, brick Well, I've been taking brick. lots of pictures, so maybe I can do like a... Yeah. Some little video of how it's changed and more. That'll be interesting. <laughs> totally. Yeah. So, no questions from? No, no questions tonight. No questions from our hundreds of viewers. I can't believe it. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So, is it time to sign out, Eric? It's or? Eight o'clock. All right. Wow. We, this was has a been robust a hour. hour. Yeah. Wow. This is I a talk long. A lot. <laughs> I thought it was really good. I love the uh, freedom and the flexibility of the conversation. So. Yeah, yeah. Because what we didn't talk, which we could do a whole other thing on, is the way you chose your user group to design the, the space, you know, which was all about reaching out to your alums. That's a whole other conversation. Seeing what were the unmet needs of your graduates and then building a program based around that. I mean, but that's a whole other topic, Eric, or not that right? I mean, but that's fascinating, Lisa, to, be, you know, to do that, to reach out to them. Um, and, and build a program out of their unmet needs. Um, yeah, I think that was part of just making the case for our Board of Ed, too. I think that was, mm. you know, it made sense. Smart. <laughs> yeah. Okay, well, um, thanks for joining. Thanks, Lisa. Um, Thank you. For having the conversation. Thanks, Eric, thanks for, you know, as usual, orchestrating all this and getting it to run smoothly. And thanks for our audience to listen in. And I know in a couple of hours, Eric will have this up on SoundCloud and YouTube. No, <laughs> Mr. Walters is going to California this weekend. So oh, okay. after that. Okay, after well, that. Have a good time. Hope I will. <laughs> and, but if you do go, the last two conversations are on SoundCloud and mm -hmm. you can. And on YouTube. Right, and they can link those from where, how do they find them, Eric, the audience? Uh, Making.marymountnyc.org under um, MLI conversations. You'll find the links to the previous ones and then yeah. we will add this one probably, we'll send a link out the end of next week and then it'll be on the website beginning of April. Right, so just Googling Marymount um, and Maker Learning Institute should bring you right there. Mm -hmm. Okay, awesome. Well, thanks again, everyone. Have a great rest of the evening. And if you want, you can join us again in a month or so April 4th with um, Dorothy Lee from the Windward School, who's going to talk about uh, the design work they're doing out there and their design and maker colloquium that's being held the beginning of May. Right, right. And if you want to know a little bit more about that, it's, it's featured in the uh, publication from Prototype to Pitch, which is, again, you can download or buy from the Maker Learning, uh, in, uh, maker Learning website. Mm -hmm. Okay. Awesome. Good night, everyone. Thanks right. for joining. Good night. Bye, guys. Thanks. All right.